it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, two people who need really no introduction, uh, who are going to have a dialogue for the next 30 minutes or so about the future of energy. Uh, please help me in welcoming Secretary William Perry and Governor Jerry Brown. Our planet today faces two existential dangers. One of them is a nuclear war, nuclear catastrophe, and the other is a climate catastrophe. The nuclear catastrophe could happen next month, next year, 10 years from now, or if we're lucky, never. But if it happens, it happens all at once. On the other hand, the climate change catastrophe is on a slow roll. It, gets, it's, it is happening. It's happening every month, every year. It's getting worse. We heard this morning that the one definition of a catastrophe might be two degrees centigrade increase in average temperature over the planet. And that might happen in 20 years. And that might be a catastrophe. So this is a slow motion catastrophe. It's a little bit like the legend of the frog in the water, and the water is heating up and gets hotter and hotter. And the frog doesn't jump, think to jump out until it's too late. And that's sort of the problem we're facing today in the energy problem, in the energy catastrophe we're facing now, the climate change catastrophe. It is slow motion, and we're not reacting to it. We know what to do, but we're not doing it. Some things are happening in the world. Some countries are acting and acting robustly to deal with this problem, individually and collectively. The Paris Accord is one example of such a collective action. For this to be fully effective, the United States, which is one of the biggest energy users, <clears throat> needs to be acting effectively and needs to be providing leadership in the world. And that is today not happening. Nevertheless, the world is moving ahead anyway. Many countries are moving ahead, both individually and collectively. And most interestingly, in some ways most surprisingly, some states are taking actions on their own without guidance from the federal government, in fact, sometimes in spite of our federal government. Most notably, of course, is the state of California, which is important not only because of the huge size of California, means what it has taken is very, action is taken is very significant, but also because of the, lead, the leadership, serving as an example, other states and even other countries. <clears throat> this action in California has been underway for a long time, and it's been nonpartisan. Governor Schwarzenegger was a strong supporter of climate change control. And of course, the last eight years, the leadership in our state, in the country, in the world on energy has been from Governor Jerry Brown. I'd like to start off by asking Jerry some questions in this field. And the first question is what are the major programs underway today in the state? Which ones do you think are the most significant and the most important? All right, I was, uh, I'm gonna list five. We're talking about um, climate change efforts, which also entail uh, reducing uh, fossil fuel energy consumption. Okay, the first is in electricity. Uh, California has set uh, what is called the portfolio standard um, to achieve ever increasing percentages of renewable energy in the electricity sector. Now, I want to make clear the electricity sector is only 20%, less than 20% of our carbon emissions. 
in part because we've been making progress in reducing emissions in that sector. But anyway, uh, our goal is 60% uh, renewable energy by 2030. Uh, we will hit 50% within the next few years, and some utilities are almost there. And when we say 60%, we don't refer to hydroelectric, which is zero emission, or the uh, remaining nuclear plants at uh, Diablo Canyon. In order to foster certain kinds of innovation, uh, we've defined renewable energy more narrowly. But according to that uh, narrow definition, uh, San Diego uh, Electric Company, Semper, is at uh, over 40% right now. So we will meet our 60% goal long before our 2030 goal. <clears throat> and then, of course, beyond that, we have 100% renewable, which will be more difficult, and we'll take the invention of storage and grid investments that we haven't made yet. So that's electricity. We're, that's our big success story. Um, uh, and by the way, we do that, <clears throat> which I think is good to understand, because we have a California Air Resources Board that has the authority. It has the authority uh, by state law, but it also has the engineers, uh, the scientists, the analysts uh, within it, this department to be able to carry out a program such as this because it does take a lot of technical uh, competence. And that was created um, by Ronald Reagan in 1969 at the same time Richard Nixon was creating the Clean Air Act. Uh, interestingly enough, under the Clean Air Act, California was given a special waiver power to articulate uh, pr promulgate its own vehicle emission standards. That gets me my second point, uh, emission standards. California uh, had the strictest emission standards in America. Uh, those were adopted and approved under the Obama administration as they must be approved in order to become effective. These standards uh, became the national standards in an agreement that President Obama made, but they came from California and they were developed out of our own Air Resources Board and by those people in that, that agency. Now President Trump has initiated uh, a program, the clock has started to run, where he's going to take away California's authority and roll back those standards so they don't meet their trajectory of ever increasing uh, vehicle efficiency and uh, corresponding reduction in carbon emissions. So. Vehicle transportation is more than 40% of the greenhouse gas emissions. And um, just by way of example, uh, car, we have about 30, over 30 million vehicles. And those vehicles, uh, vehicle miles traveled is about uh, 300, and somewhere 340, 350 billion miles a year. So this is quite, um, quite a challenge and electric and hydrogen cars are absolutely crucial. And to achieve that, we need technolo technological innovation, which is occurring, but we have to speed it up. And in that respect, uh, China has set a goal uh, to uh, be dominant in battery technology, and that directly affects the American and world auto industry. So we not only need the proper regulations, which our president is trying to uh, undermine, in fact, destroy. And we also need the investment by private capital and public capital in the various aspects of uh, battery technology and uh, other technologies that go to low emission vehicles. We also have a low carbon fuel standard. This is the one the oil companies like least. Um, we set a goal by 2020 that 10% of all fuel in California has to be what we call low carbon. And that is defined in by regulation, uh, it's a very, very uh, small amount of carbon emission for that. And we have a 10% goal, and the state has proposed to adopt increasing that to 20 to 20% 20 uh, by 2020. To the extent that the oil companies can't meet that, they then have to buy allowances, <clears throat> and they have to pay, in effect, uh, the people who are building either electric cars, biofuels or other uh, corresponding industries 
that are able to provide uh, what the automobile companies can't do. So low carbon fuel reduces um, uh, oil demand and oil consumption. It's a very powerful, uh, very powerful instrument, but uh, contested and uh, more controversial. But there it is. Uh, the next thing, we have a cap and trade program. Uh, I know George Schultz wants a carbon tax, but uh, we don't have a carbon tax. That was a Republican that did that, George. That was Schwarzenegger. He, in, he invented the cap and trade, so I carried it out and it increased it. By the way, there is a carbon tax in the state of Washington, and uh, the oil companies are fighting it. So, but our cap and trade system uh, is a system where we put a cap on emissions in major industries, refine, uh, refineries, uh, food processing, uh, cement, a whole range of industries. There's a cap, and they have to meet the cap. And if they don't meet it, then they have to buy allowances. Those allowances have already generated about seven billion that we then plow into various uh, climate-related research and activity. So that's cap and trade. That should give us 20% of our goal of our uh, reduction to get to get to our 2030 goals. And um, ultimately, in 2045, we're going to want to be at zero. Uh, and then our last point, fifth point, is efficiency. We have appliance standards and we have uh, building standards. And those are ratcheted up over time. I um, was governor when the Energy Commission was created. And the first energy standards uh, for appliances and for buildings. Just to give you a sense of what that entails, it took eight years for the building regulations to be written, and then uh, it took another year to put them out because there was a certain amount of political give and take, and I decided we should delay it. So it took nine years to write those building regulations, and those uh, have been changed at least three times uh, recently in the last couple of years. So that governs new buildings, uh, modifications to buildings, commercial, industrial, and residential. And the goal, of course, is to get to new buildings that will be zero net energy because the renewable energy they'll have uh, connected to that building or the efficient way in which the building is built. So that's our main thrust. And I would say things are, are probably as far-reaching far, far as any uh, jurisdiction in the world, but our number one challenge uh, is transportation, and the only way that transportation will come, will meet our goals, is if we get the battery uh, technology uh, cheaper, lighter, more efficient. That when if we that keeps going at that rate, we'll be able to meet our goals. But that's a function of investments here in Silicon Valley, in China, all over the world. So we are dependent. Uh, we can't do that. Uh, just in Sacramento. That depends on people, uh, investors, and governments all over the world. But I think I'd say we're, we're, well, let me put it this way. We're doing more than most, but it's not adequate. And relative to the, the science of climate change, we're still slipping behind. And uh, a lot of the people since the Paris Agreement are uh, slacking off. Germany's emissions are going up. Uh, burning more coal. Australia wants to burn more coal. Same thing with Japan. So we have quite a challenge uh, to be able to transform the economy and do it in a, an efficient, politically acceptable way. Uh, we're doing a lot, but I think there's nothing to take, uh, to pause or to congratulate about. It's all challenged as far as I'm concerned. These are very impressive programs, and they're important in and of themselves, but they also are important because they're influencing other states to follow California's lead. Can you tell me a little bit about what, you're, what, what your work with other governors, other states, what you might be doing to try to help them or influence them in this direction? Yeah, we have an under two coalition. Uh, I started with the uh, uh, leader uh, of Baden-Wattenberg a couple of years ago. and We now have over 200 governors, prime ministers, leaders from states, provinces, and regions throughout the world, representing about 40% of the world's gross domestic product and about 25% uh, of the world's population. And they've all committed to uh, keeping 
their own emissions consistent with keeping the world emissions under two degrees centigrade growth from industrial times. So uh, we are building an alliance. We have provinces in China, uh, all the, all the, um, uh, all the continents of the world. Uh, but I would say there too, there, there people have a desire, but the technical expertise in government uh, is limited. And California is blessed. <clears throat> we both have the research uh, here uh, in California, and we have the businesses, and we have the government counterparts, and we're pushing. But we need uh, to do a lot. Now, for example, what we've done, not just with other states, but our Air Resources Board worked with China in the uh, development of their cap and trade program. Because when you have a cap and trade program, you have to develop a, a system for measuring emissions by company. And then you have to develop an auditing process. And that requires a lot of transparency. And that has been a struggle. But we have been providing ongoing um, advice and work with China. And we're doing that with other states. And uh, we'll do that to a lesser extent with other provinces. So these are, this is the effort of sub-national jurisdictions as opposed to the nation states. But I would say the nation states are not taking seriously um, the climate change. I'd say nuclear and climate change <clears throat> has a similar um, lack of, of attention uh, relative to what the threat is. <clears throat> and we should have a lot more response, a lot more attention than, than we have. Jerry, you're going to be <clears throat> passing the energy baton under your successor next year. <clears throat> Do you have any way of estimating now whether these programs that you started are going to be continued, diminished, increased, or what? Well, I think, I think because from what I can understand about the science um, of climate change, the things are changing. The evidence, whether it's the Arctic uh, or Antarctica or uh, tropical diseases or forest fires in California or intensity of hurricanes, <clears throat> the effects of a warming climate are becoming more obvious. So based on that, I would, I would think that the next governor will continue along this path. And certainly, uh, I think the most probable uh, next governor definitely shares that view. I, I sound some note of caution because a lot of this is not really in our hands. Let's take our, uh, our portfolio standard. We were talking a few years ago about getting 20% renewable by 2020. The utility said, that's ridiculous, can't be done. Well, one of the things that happened is China uh, really pumped money into photovoltaics. In fact, uh, people would say they were dumping, they were um, unlawfully subsidizing. But because they did that, and they built so, uh, so much of it, so much photovoltaic, the price came down. And as the price came down, it became the utilities were able to buy, uh, get uh, utility contracts uh, for uh, solar energy at much lower than anybody thought was, would be possible five years ago. So the technology, the breakthrough is crucial at keeping the march forward because if things are too expensive, it gets very hard. The political appetite uh, for paying more, uh, it is challenging. Uh, so I think that's the constraint. Uh, and it's a constraint in China. They got a big coal industry, as it changed from Merkel in Germany, uh, because she had an affiliation with the Greens. She had to get off of nuclear as part of that coalition. But then she substituted with coal, which didn't make any sense. But those are the vagaries. Uh, and there are cost items, and there's political items based on the interest groups. So uh, th this takes, uh, it takes a lot of external factors going in the right direction. And so far, uh, things have been going, we're making progress. Uh, but the curve that <clears throat> to where we are, it's going to get steeper. Uh, we're, we're, we started about 465 million tons of greenhouse gas equivalent a year. 
Now we're down to 435 or 440, if we can measure them that accurately. And we're starting to get down to like 165. That's a very steep curve. How the hell are we going to do that? Um, it's going to take every, every conceivable market, regulatory, investment, R&D, private, public effort. So it, and it, it, it's almost like a, uh, almost, I don't want to say a war footing, but it takes some, some of that uh, heroism uh, to deal with climate change. And we're by no means at that topic. I mean, in Congress, half the people there deny uh, climate change or don't want to talk about it. So we got to, first you got to acknowledge it, then you got to get a path forward, and then you got to be willing to, to pay and to adapt in the way you have to. All of that, I think, is an open question of, of how, how we're going to get it done. So I, I don't want to be too discouraging, but I don't want you to feel good when you leave here. I want, <laughs> I want you to have a little bit of, a little tug in your stomach that, gosh, we got to do something more, because that's the truth. Well, you've left a legacy that you can be very proud of, but there's still much unfinished business in the energy field. If you had another two years before you were the head of your governor, what would be your focus on energy? What's the unfinished business you'd want to tackle and put the primary energies on? Well, we've been putting a lot on, on electric vehicles. Uh, we're building uh, charging stations. Um, I'm trying to... Uh, we, we, we're constrained by the federal government in the adoption of emission standards. We have to get a waiver. And now that whole process is now under attack. I mean, by under attack, I mean there is a proposal by the Environmental Protection Agency that is filed with the uh, Federal Register to uh, destroy uh, the regulatory regime that we have. And in fact, what I'd like to see is an increased uh, commitment to uh, zero emission vehicles. And uh, the, the auto companies are responding. They have like 30 different kind of uh, electric, electric cars. So the, the, we have electric buses, electric school buses are coming in pretty good. We have two companies, one Chinese, one American in California that are building uh, electric buses. So I think what I would like to do is to get that transportation um, going. And we have this, zero, this uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, we just gave the permit, the state of California, for Google. Should, I don't know if it's gone out yet, but it should be going out today or tomorrow, where they can start testing the autonomous vehicles on the streets. So there's a lot of change that can help us uh, reduce the emissions in the transportation sector. And that's an area that I would very much like to work on, and also getting other states and the federal government to be part of it, because we can't do it alone. California is not an island. Is California industry rising to the energy challenge? How much are the things that are being done by industry are in response to regulations, and how much is it in response to the economics of the situation? The economics can be pushing it, but the regulations are on top of it. Which is more important here, the economics or the regulations? Well, the regulation is important, because we set, like, the portfolio standard. We say that uh, PG&E has to have, you know, 30%. Well, we said 20%, and then we upped it to 30, and now we just upped it to 50, and then we just upped it again to 60. Well, they're actually buying. People are coming. They have to get to 60%. So individual companies come along, and they, they have, they have uh, solar or wind or geothermal. Uh, maybe bio, uh, uh, bio material, uh, energy sources, uh, bio, uh, and they come along and they, they bid, and PG&E has to buy uh, to get to the, to, the ver to, the, to the target, 60%. So that regulation drives actual purchases, and because it's a regulated utility, the capital is there because the Public Utilities Commission will assure they get uh, a proper rate of return. So the money is there, the policies are in place because they're legally mandated, and the companies are in the market uh, actively evaluating bids uh, from uh, entrepreneurs who are selling them 
uh, principally solar in California, and that is going up all the time. So that's where regulation can really stimulate. And I think the same thing is true in, in electric vehicles. Uh, we, it's not, the regulation isn't strong enough, in my opinion, to really push the electric cars in the way they electric trucks and things that we have to do. So you need the right regulation, not too much, not muddle-headed, not inflexible, uh, but then, you, of course, you need the investment uh, to, to bring the technology to market. So you need, you need, it's a collaborative effort. We've heard in earlier briefings today that there's a very promising future for autonomous vehicles. As a governor, you have conflicting interests here. On the one hand, the opportunity to see this new technology move forward and the economy move forward. On the other hand, is a public safety issue. How do you balance those, or how, could you, how should those be balanced properly? That's a good question. Um, because when I first uh, heard about these autonomous uh, vehicles, I, I could tell it's a, um, it's a big issue because um, Sergey Brin and Larry Page called and said, we want to come to the governor's mansion and talk to you. So they spent two hours talking to me. Well, that's the only time I ever talked to them. <laughs> and very few CEOs are saying, I can come and talk to you. It doesn't happen. Usually I'm calling them to give me a campaign contribution or something. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got the idea it's important, and I listened to them, and it is important. But yeah, we're, we're letting them, they're driving around. They got, I don't know how many hundreds of cars they have uh, permission for. Uh, but they're putting them on the street, and um, uh, yeah, I do. I do wonder seeing all these cars with nobody behind the drivers, uh, behind the wheel. Uh, yeah, that seems a little spooky to me. Uh, but everybody, they seem. To, everybody's investing in it. They, this seems to be like uh, a no-brainer. So I, I just hope between now and the time I leave, there are no accidents. <laughs> but it seems like well. We have our Department of Motor Vehicles. Hopefully you haven't tried to get a license the last few years. Because <laughs> that's what we really need. We need an autonomous Department of Motor Vehicles that <laughs> would give you a license like that. <laughs> By the way, it's not entirely the bureaucracy, the poor computer system. You know, these things have to be upgraded. We're a little slow. Then we uh, get this real ID where you have to have a very special identification. Uh, that costs money. And then we had the uh, the undocumented, we had about a million people in that category, and that took a lot of time. And then we have this thing where you get your voter registration uh, at the same time. All that was more than the poor DMV could uh, figure out. So they're digging themselves out of the hole. Things are getting much faster, particularly if you make an appointment. Anyway, in between <laughs> the time they're doing all this stuff, they got to develop a, a protocol for how autonomous vehicles work. And they first say, you can test this many under these conditions with this kind of um, monitoring. And that's what we're doing. So, mm. I mean, we're putting our faith in the Department of Motor Vehicles. We have time for one more question. I'm going to throw you a softball. What's that? Uh, it's pretty clear that if energy costs were made accurately, that we'd be moving a lot faster towards energy efficiency. So what I'd like to do is give you an opportunity to expound a little bit on carbon tax. <laughs> How important it is, what's the right way of doing it, what success we've had, and what obstacles you've run into. Well, obviously, you've got to put a price on carbon, because it has externalities that have to be taken into account. And the externality of a rising temperature is huge. So that has to be priced. Uh, it would probably be a rather, a rather large price. So you have to figure out how you, probably if you're going to put up a significant price, you're going to have to rebate that so that you can cushion the effect. And otherwise, politically, it would be virtually impossible. And we'll see what happens up in, in Washington. Uh, I think cap and trade is a, we have that system. Uh, I don't think I could have passed a carbon tax. Uh, so the one we had, uh, I, I decided I would, I would improve that. I think it has some value. 
It doesn't sound as scary as a carbon tax. People don't like taxes. Well, we'll find out how much you like taxes. Depending on what the vote, if the vote on six is no, then you'll know that people like taxes. Or they don't know what Proposition 6 is. Anyway, um, any event, I, I do think we need a price on carbon. We need a federal price. Uh, we need negotiations with the countries of the world. Uh, in fact, the UN, uh, the uh, UN is promoting this, but it takes national governments. It takes the president of China and Russia and, and uh, all of them. But so the answer is it takes a universal price on carbon, and I think that will have a lot of opposition from coal companies, oil companies, um, whomever. But that's, that's the way to go. And if we can, can get that idea through, and I think whatever can make that tax saleable is what we need, because the most important thing is putting the burden on carbon so its true cost, its truer cost, uh, is, is recognized, is put into the price that you have to pay, because we are definitely uh, taking free goods and spending them by our air and our climate. So yeah, I think how you do that, um, easier to say it than to actually make that happen in the American political system or in any other political system. Now, the common, common market has a price on carbon. It's about $25. It's gone up. But the thing is going to have to go a lot higher than that. Jerry, I'd like to conclude this program by thanking you for the significant and the concrete actions you've taken to deal with climate change in your eight years as governor.